there's something special about that song, Good, Good Father, and uh, I really like the line that we get to say when we sing that together, you're perfect in all your ways. You're perfect in all your ways. As a father, many of you who are fathers, um, we're not perfect in all our ways. In fact, we're far from it. And God is our father as well, and he is gracious and kind to forgive, and I'm thankful for that because I need it, (laughs) because being a father is difficult. Being a father is uh, one of the greatest joys in my life. I feel like that's like everything else is secondary almost, especially when you have been a dad long enough. Like some of you young guys that are just kind of stepping into fatherhood, it's like this is kind of new territory for me. And um, I feel like every single thing in my life has something to do with something with my kids or something. Like everything. Like every, everything that I'm involved with, everything that I'm a part of, everything that I think about, everything that we do. Um, just just a while ago, I was thinking of, um, you know, just as – as you get older and you think about little things that your father has said or done, or maybe you didn't have a great relationship with your dad. Like my, I didn't have a terrific relationship with my dad. And, and so as I was, uh, you know, during the, um, that song, like at the beginning of that song, I was in the back. And, and uh, one of the things that I do is kind of goofy because I do a lot of goofy stuff is I like to do my own like um, percussion kind of thing. So I'm, when I'm, if I'm listening to music or something, like I, I play guitar on my seatbelt. And so I like make like the the little like shaker noises sometimes with my hands and stuff like that. I do I do stuff like that. It's weird, I know, it's strange. And so as I was back there, I, was, I saw Rain. She looked at me. She started doing it. So she was like, you know, as Caitlin was shaking the shaker up here and it sounded really good. Rain had her own little shaker going. Like you just rub, like put your hands together, try it. I'm I'm not super weird. Go ahead, just try this. Like you just rub your hands together. You can hear like the shh. Okay. That's kind of one of my things, right? And so um, my kids, are, I guess they grow up, and you know, when they're old one day, they're going to be listening to music, and they're going to be like, yeah, my dad used to like rub the seatbelt and make like the shaker noises and stuff like that. What a gift it is to be a dad. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's very amazing. And I'm grateful that God has graciously given me an amazing wife and given me amazing kids. Um, tonight, we're going to jump into... The next section in James, um, which is, is pretty difficult. Last week, we talked about, uh, I believe probably last week was, was pretty instructive to me, but also pretty challenging. We talked about two big character traits that, that mark somebody who is an authentic Christian. And those two big character traits, if you remember, they were wisdom and humility. We said those are two huge things that should mark the life of a Christian so that when someone looks at them or around them long enough, they say, well, they're authentic. They're the real deal. They're the real thing. For one, is this character trait of wisdom and humility that just kind of shines forth in their life. But not just character traits, but actions, things that we do. This week, tonight, what we're going to look at, we're looking at several actions. And so I told you that the book of James almost functions like the, like the Proverbs of the New Testament. There's just a lot of like little, little chopped up things where like you can take one you can, you can take just part of a verse, and there's just one little thought and part of a verse that's just like, if you just do that, man, that could be life-changing right there. Not even a whole verse. It's just like four or five words together, and it's like a command where James is like, pop, do this, and it is, can be absolutely life-altering. I don't know about you, but growing up in, in school, like, and I've heard people say that they're good at taking tests. Anybody, you ever heard anybody say that? They're just a good test taker. Those people aren't good test takers. They're smart, okay? If you were like me growing up and you were not a good test taker, that means <laughs> you're not as smart as the good test takers. Uh, and you can say what you want, and I understand, I get it, but like I was the guy that was not a good test taker. In fact, when I took the ACT, I didn't finish. I'm just like, I'm done. And I went through the end of it like this, ACDC, ACDC, ACDC. ACDC. And I turned it over and I said, I'm done. ACDC all the way to the end. That's how I finished the ACT. And I'm not going to tell you what I made because it was 19, not enough. Okay. James 
chapter 1, verses 19, and then we'll go through several verses tonight. But, but there's, this, there's just something about this little package of Scripture right here that I think that like, it's time for me, in the middle of our series so far, this is part four, it's time for me to give you a test, okay? It's time for a pop quiz. It's time for a test. Are you all excited? Are you nervous? When you come into the class, the teacher's like, close your books, put them up. It's time for a pop quiz. Like, I'm melted when that happened. In fact, I was like, I'm going to flip out. Like, I escaped class sometimes. I skipped school in the middle of class because the teacher, no, I didn't do that. Don't do that, kids. It's a bad idea. So, we're going we're gonna to ask ourselves some questions, all right? We're going to take a test tonight. We're going to see how well you do with taking tests. It's only six questions. I promise it's not that hard. We've studied. You're going to do okay. I feel like I'm talking to you like class. It's going to be all right, though. But God's Word, <laughs> the Bible does that sometimes. It gives us like, like some type of mirror to look into, and we're like, yeah, I, that's, I'm, I don't get it. Like, I'm not getting it. I'm failing it. This is not me. I'm not measuring up. So let's look at some of these, and I think we're going to need help with these. So let's, let's, let's pray first, and then we'll jump into James chapter 1, starting in verse 19. God, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for helping us. God, as we uh, look to your word tonight, God, I pray that you would open up our ears and our hearts to receive, God, what you would have for us tonight. Lord, we love you. We pray this in your good name. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 19. So the first question, how do you respond to frustrating people and circumstances? It's a good question, right? How do you respond? This is your first question on the test class. How do you respond to frustrating people and circumstances? Some of you do a little better than others with this, but also some of you have more frustrating people in your life and more frustrating circumstances in your life. You know, uh, as you know, we have five kids, and not so much because most of my kids are in the room, but there can be times that are frustrating. But I told you last week, um, you know, I was, I was thinking about how sometimes Cam, our four-year-old, sometimes he can be pretty frustrating. But then I told you last week about a friend of mine who I'm still praying for about his son, who's four, I believe he's four, um, has this inoperable brain tumor. And he, is, he just began treatment, and he's not responding well to treatment. In fact, like, the fluid is swelling, and the tumor is swelling, and he's not doing good. Now, I was thinking about that as I was frustrated with Cameron today, and I'm, I'm thinking some of the whining and stuff that's getting on my nerves, that's probably a little better than something else that could be going on. But James gives us this, this question, I think, that you can pull out of this. Verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear Slow to speak and slow to anger. I heard somebody say one time that God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. So we got to double listen and slow down. Listen, 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 listen before you dive in and speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Listen. Listen to God. Listen to others. Slow down. And so as I was thinking about this passage, like what kind of, what, what's God getting to with this, this thought right here? And I think it really is, how do, how, do you, how do you, that's the question for the quiz, is how do you respond to the frustrating people and the frustrating circumstances in your life? I think a lot of people, uh, they get angry quick. They're quick to anger. And I find myself sometimes getting quick to anger, especially if I'm like on the road and people are driving not like me. That's when I get mad. You can drive like you. I'm fine if you drive like you, just as long as your driving is a lot like my driving. Because if everybody drove like me, we would, it, would, it would be fantastic, right? That's how you're thinking too, right? That's when we get mad at people driving, we're frustrated behind the wheel. It's because you want other people to drive like you until you make a mistake. But that doesn't ever happen, right? Never. So how do you respond? Or do you respond with impatient anger? How, quick, how small is your fuse? Just think about that. Now, if you're brave enough, ask the people in your life. Now, they might be terrified to talk to you about that. That's a good indicator that you've you got a jacked up fuse. Right? 
if you say, come on, be honest with me. Do I get mad really easy? How, how long is my fuse? Am, am I, do I need to work on, am, am I impatient with my anger? And if they turn just like a ghost and they're like, we got to talk about this? This is what you need. This is how you need to respond. Oh, failed. The red pen comes out, scratch it. Look, you failed that, that, that question, scratch it off. Or maybe, maybe you need to learn how to respond more in patient resilience. I was thinking, about this, like, what's the difference between, uh, what's the opposite of impatient anger would be patient resilience, right? Now, you find yourself in, with, in difficult, frustrating relationships. You're going to have those, right? You're going to have those in your work environment. You're going to have those possibly in your home sometimes. Your neighbors might be frustrating to you. You will always have that. You will never get away from people who will frustrate you, Okay. Some of you are very good at just patiently, just, just like dealing with people being just, and in, in this is how you think, like, why are they being so dumb? Like, that's stupid. Like, you just get so frustrated so easily with people, okay? Now, unless you find a way to move off to a cave and never interact with anybody, then you're not going to have any frustrating relationships in your life. But God did not design us that way. He did not design us for us to bury our head in the sand and, and like walk away, find some hole somewhere. No, he designed us to be in relationship with people. That's part of what the church is about. That's part of, of what being married is about, having relationship with your, with your children. They can be frustrating. I can be frustrating to the people who, I, who have a relationship with me. Now, how do you respond? You know, throughout your life, you're going to have one thing after another that's going to come your way. This frustrating circumstances. Maybe you're right now in the middle of, of a frustrating circumstance. You just like plopped into it. You're in the middle of it. You're trying to figure out, trying to navigate. Like, you're, like did I do something to bring this about? And you've settled in your heart that no, it just happened. This is not my fault. This just happened. But here I am in the middle of a frustrating circumstance. So I have to walk this path. You know, life is a long journey full of frustrating roads. There's times on that path of life that whatever happens brings you to some kind of crossroad, and maybe it's a, a choice that you make in wisdom. You say, well, let's go down this path. And while you're heading down that path, something happens. You get frustrated. You get all mixed up. James is telling us, look, be be, be quick to hear what people have to say. Listen. Pay attention to all the details of the situation. Even in a it's frustrating circumstance, see what God is doing. See what God is putting together. Maybe, maybe in the middle of your frustrating relationship or the frustrating circumstances you're in, maybe God's trying to do something in your life, in your heart. Maybe there's something more going on. What you, why don't you just pray about that? Ask God, like, God, is there something more you want me to see here? Because if you're in the middle of something frustrating, those are the kind of questions you're, you're thinking. Am I missing something here? Right? You ever thought that? Like, what in the world? I, miss, I got to be missing something. Like, I see this, this, and this happening, and what am I missing? This is a mess. I'm looking at a mess here, but nobody else is seeing it, so what am I missing? Maybe you need to turn that thought to a prayer. Whatever frustrating circumstance you're in right now, or you're about to be in, Hello, that's life. There's one frustrating thing after another. I'm not being Johnny Raincloud up here. I'm just being rod realistic. This is how it is. Life is just one. That was like totally off the cuff right there. Like I didn't practice that or anything, but that worked out okay, right? <laughs> like that's just life. One frustrating thing after another. And you, sometimes we feel like you get, we get a little bit ahead in something, and then we find another little pothole that we fall into. And you're like, what in the world? What am I missing here? Turn that to a prayer. Ask God that. In the midst of your frustrating circumstance, ask God, like, what am I, what am I missing here? Because here's what it says right after that. Be, so be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. It says, for the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. So anger produces something, right? From your anger, something happens. Now, from your anger, you learn how to do something, like let the steam out some other way, but anger always produces something. Hopefully, anger teaches us 
how to grow in the righteousness of God as we persevere in this patient resilience that we all need. So just take 10 deep breaths. Slow down before you speak. Hear people. I read a book uh, a couple years back. It was really good. It was more like a psychology book, so most of y'all probably be like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> no, thanks. It's called The Lost Art of Listening, and it was very instructive. Every person, I think, and that has any kind of relationship or anything, so that would be helpful to read that. Learn how to listen to your kids. Learn how to listen to your coworkers, your neighbor, your wife, all that kind of stuff. Question number two. Let's keep going. This is a hard test, y'all. Question number two, on a scale of one to ten, how would you rate purity in your life? Yikes. How well are you doing so far? Just calm down. No, don't sweat. It's not that hard of a test. First question, you might have missed it. You might do better on this one. Maybe not, huh? How would you rate yourself? Scale of one to ten. Doing great? And I would say if, if there's a chance that if you hear that question and you're like, oh, pff, I got this, 10, there's something maybe that you don't realize. Because when you're talking about purity in your life, you're talking about purity of, of heart, purity of thought, purity of speech. So if somebody in your life has a relationship with you that is one of those relationships of full disclosure. Hopefully you have people in your life. Absolute full disclosure. Can you go to that person and, and just be open and honest about just the issues of purity in your life? If you would, if you would be embarrassed to just lay it all out in front of a trusted friend, if you'd be embarrassed, I mean, let's just be honest. Like, if we, if we look at this question, we're like, man, that's, you went there? On a scale of 1 to 10, can we go backwards? Can we go negative 18 on this scale? I mean, if we're smart and we've lived long enough, uh, did anybody in here get above maybe a 5 or 6 maybe? I mean, I don't know. If you did, I, I'd like to chat with you. I want to learn, <laughs> especially when you start talking about like all the avenues that purity touches in your life, all of it, everything from just how you look at somebody to how you look at your finances, like purity goes through every avenue of your life, and on one to ten scale, like how we doing? So James says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. In Job 4, Job asked this question, can mortal man be in the right before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? Now, if you've read through Job, you know Job asked a lot of questions. He's in the midst of a very suffering, terrible, frustrating circumstance. And he's got a lot of questions. And he's got some frustrating relationships in his life. So purity comes up. Can anybody be pure before God at all, ever, whatsoever? Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure. I don't think these are coming up on the screen. I don't think I put them in the slideshow. But the Bible says in Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure, like silver refined in the furnace on the ground purified seven times. Psalm 119, 9, we've read this before. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. So when you ask yourself, scale of 1 to 10, how how you doing with purity in your life? A lot of that question, a lot of that conversation has a lot to do with how much scriptural intake, commitment, love, devotion to God's word. It's, very, it's a very simple concept, yet it is one of the most difficult, challenging things that we can experience in our whole life. Because we all desire purity in our life. No one would stand up and be like, nope, I want to be wor- I want to be filthy. I want to be dirty. I want God to look at me and say, gross. No, nobody, would, nobody thinks like that. And the, the, it's very simple, though, yet extremely difficult. 
God's word, it says right here in Psalm 119.9, how, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to the word. God's word in your life is like the ramparts. It's like the walls set up with sharp-eyed marksmen awake and alert and on point. When something unpure starts creeping in, they are scoped in, ready to take it out. And those shots, those watchmen, that's just Bible. That's just the word of God just filtering and filtering and filtering. It's like a washing. It's like a washing and a washing. It'd be like if you took your dirty car to the car wash and you drove through, and there's a couple workers out there, and they're like, all right, see you later. No, I'm going back through. Okay. Got another car wash, and you're like, did, and the guy's like, did it work that time? Oh, yeah, but I'm going back through. It's probably still a little bit more dirty. I'm going to go back, and you just keep, like, all day you just go through the car wash. Everybody's going to think you're crazy. I'm going to think you're crazy. You're spending a lot of money on 14,000 car washes. But if you take God's word, which is way better than a car wash, it's a soul wash, and it just rinses and cleans. It's like the bleach of our heart. Every time I've ever had a conversation with somebody that's just breaking apart in an area of, of purity, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll take a side to her and say, well, tell me about how, how much Bible you're, you're reading and studying and memorizing. That's one of the things that kept me spiritually alive when I was in college. Because I moved into the dorm and I had a pastor friend of mine before I moved into the dorm. Because I was thinking that God wanted me to do ministry. And he looked at me square in the eye and said, you need to study and read the Bible at least two hours every single day. You're crazy. Okay, I'll do it. Then I went and moved into the dorms. A bunch of guys. And it was crazy. Dorms were crazy. And there was things that other guys were doing that I did not go near touching. I'd go in my room and I'd open my Bible and have my little pad. And I was like making notes and stuff like that. And my door was open and craziness was happening out in the hallway. I'm telling you, I know this for a fact. God's word. The more you press it in, the more the unsanitary, filthy stuff presses up. It's got no place in your heart. Just receive that implanted word. Your purity in heart will always be tied to your commitment to Scripture. Put away filthiness. The way you do that is receive the word. All right, we like our test here. Question number three. True or false? Most of the time when I read or hear the word of God, I do what it says. Every time. Most of the time. True or false? Don't answer it out loud. Because if you answer it out loud, you know, you might look great or look not great. Depends on what you say. But uh, probably both of those answers would not make you look great, right? <laughs> False. I never do what it says. Or if you say, true, I do what it says every time. People are going to look at you like, no, you don't. Especially if you sit next to your wife. She's like, no, you do not. But be doers of the... Okay, so good. No one's there to elbow you, right? James one twenty two. But be doers of the word. Not hearers only. Deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man that looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he's like. That's an interesting analogy that James gives us. So if you are not in just who you are in your life, if you're not doing what the Bible says, if you're just hearing it, James is like, then you're like that guy that looks in the mirror and then walks away. He's like, wait a minute. What am I, who am I supposed to be? But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and freedom, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. I love this promise with this. If you commit yourself, to read the Bible, hear the Bible, and then say, okay, this is what God says, then I'm going to apply it to my life. I'm going to do that. And then the Bible says, if you do, then you're going to be blessed. Now, blessed in our culture today, if, someone, if I were to look at you and I, and I were to say, there's going to be, I know this, God showed me last night in my prayer time 
tomorrow God is going to pour out a huge blessing on you. Like if I was one of those one of those guys and I could like make like pronounce that on your life or something like that. Here's probably what you were, you'd be thinking. Like am I going to get a check in the mail or something? Am I going to is somebody going to show up like with the cardboard check like Mr. Wallace $5,000 a week for life. That's the blessing that he was taught. Like he can do that. See, here's the thing. Like when, when, when the Bible says he will be blessed in all of his doings, painfully, just unfortunately, the truth in our culture, in the West, in America, when we think we are greatly blessed, we always think of it like it's some kind of financial check or something like that. Some kind of some kind of like gift, <laughs> like a nugget or something like that. You're you're mowing the yard. And you stump your toe and you look at it, it's a big gold nugget, 14 pounds. You're like, what a blessing, right? Now, that could be a curse. But see, being blessed is way different according to what the Bible says. It has nothing to do with, with money. Now, it might be an avenue that God can use through some kind of financial something. But it doesn't mean that he'll be, he'll be rewarded financially in all that he does because he's doing what the Bible says. Because here's the thing, you study the Bible long enough, you study the New Testament long enough, and if you were to look at the way of Christ, and you were like, I'm going to do everything that that says, then there's a good chance you might not have a whole lot of money on this, on this planet. But you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed beyond what you can even describe to people. So most of the time, when I read the Bible, do I do what it says? Here's some things. Now, some of you are thinking, like, well, I don't know. Well, the Bible talks about abstaining from the appearances of evil. What? And I know that's hard for some people because, like, well, that's for, like, those holy huddle Christians that are, like, whatever we do, we can't even look like we're, doing, we're up to something naughty. And it, you know, causes people to stay far away from certain things. But the Bible does say that. So what does that even mean? Was, did Jesus do a bad job of that? Because he was hanging out with some pretty rough people. He actually invited some of the roughest people to be his closest friends. So did he stay away from the appearance of evil? He was a friend of sinner and a friend of holiness. See, you can abstain from the appearance of evil, but also be a friend of holiness. That's a balance. That's a hard balance to find. So, but the Bible says that, so how are you doing with that? What about just sharing the word of God with people? Just sharing the gospel with people. We see it over and over and over. Jesus gives the command to his followers to, to go out and make disciples. You've heard that before. Are you doing that? So you're asking me true or false when I read the word, do I do what it says? What about, the Bible talks about in Romans 16 to, to avoid troublemakers. What about when it talks about don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers? What about when it says, do everything without complaining or murmuring. You complain a lot. What about when it talks about honoring your rulers, praying for those in authority over your life? Every four years when elections come around, man, the people who are the these, you know, these these Christians, they, they just demonize people. And social media has given them this platform that they're allowed to do that, and it's just crazy to me. When, when, like, Paul and Peter, when he said, you have to honor the emperor. He is not honorable. I am not honoring the emperor. Yeah, you are. Because that's what the Bible says. Don't let your left hand know what the right hand is doing. What if you did something incredibly generous for somebody? Here's probably what a lot of us would do. We'd be like, man, I had this, and you'd post it on your feed. What a great experience I had today. I was able to, man, I was able to meet this guy who was, he was, ha he was having some problems. We were able to help him. Sometimes it's good to do things in secret. God honors the good deeds done in secret. What about when the Bible says pray for your enemies? Some of you are like, well, I don't have any enemies. Well, if you did, would you pray good things for them? That's what it, that's what it means when it says pray for your enemies. It doesn't mean pray that God would drop a meteor on their house. You did pray for them, right? No, pray blessings in their life. That's hard. Are you doing what it says? 
study to show yourself approved? The Bible tells us, us that. When's the last time you're like, I'm going to do this Bible study, and it's going to take 30, 45 minutes a night, and I'm going to study through it, and I'm going to like, and what, when's the last time you're like, I'm going to plow through numbers? You know, there's a lot in the Bible that, you know, little details that God has it there for a reason. What about not seeking the approval of man? So many times, so many of us, the biggest issue that we, one of the biggest issues we've got in our lives is just having the approval of man in our life. God says, don't, you don't seek the approval of man, you seek the approval of God. So when we see passages like that, and we study some of those, we ask the question, most of the time when I read or hear the word of God, I do what it says. How's, look, we're just on question four. Is this a tough test? Question number four, how well do you control your words? Verse 26 of James. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, deceives his heart this person your religion is worthless what do you what what do you say do you say things you shouldn't say sometimes or do you not say things that you should say that's bridling your tongue and, and sometimes people are like well i don't use curse words that doesn't mean you've bridled your tongue very well that just means there are certain Four-letter words in the English vocabulary that you never say. That doesn't mean you've controlled your tongue. Because if you never say certain words that have been deemed inappropriate, and you also never tell anybody about Jesus, who cares if you hadn't said those four-letter words? That person's never heard about Christ. Do you embellish or exaggerate your stories to make you look different or make other people look different? Make somebody else look worse? Do you gossip? And that's, so when you're saying, I don't use curse words, man, there's a lot of things. You could be talking behind somebody's back. I'm going to look at you right now and say, you kiss your mom with that mouth? What, do you, what comes, look, speak life. Your words matter. Real quick, they're not on the screen, I don't think, but maybe they are. Proverbs 18, 21. Is that, yeah. Let's read these real quick. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such that is good for building up and fits the occasion that you may give grace to those who hear. Proverbs 12, 18. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Maybe you've sliced some people up in your life with your words. Matthew 12. I tell you, on the day of judgment will give an account for every careless word they speak. We're going to give an account for every careless word we speak. Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stirs up anger. Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. So how well do you control your words? Keep going. Our test is difficult. Question number five. Yes or no? Do you seek out people who are poor and destitute for the purpose of helping them? Next verse in James. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God. God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. I think it's very peculiar the way that's worded. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. I mean, so does that mean that to, for me to be like, check, nailed it, that means I just got to go to an orphanage and just poke my head and say, hey, all right, I'm going to go over here to this old folks' home now. Hey, Whew, get back to my business now. I did that. Check. No, that means that you're look, actively looking paying attention to your surroundings and the relationship stuff going on. You're actively looking for opportunities to genuinely help somebody that is forgotten, that is broken, that is hurt, that is crushed, the orphan, the widow, the poor, the helpless, etc. This is the embodiment of the life of Christ. That's what he did. When the kids came up to him, they're like, send them away, Lord. And like, you be quiet. This is what the kingdom of heaven is. Little bit of kids sitting on my lap. That's what it's about. 
and the orphan and the widow come to Jesus, the one who is destitute and hopeless, the leper, the person that nobody wanted to be around. Jesus went to the leper colony and embraced them, actively seeking opportunities to find somebody that is broken in a sense and go and, and help them. Do you realize how much medication that is for your soul? If you're struggling or wrestling through like times of just mental weariness, maybe depression, anxiety, just feeling kind of crushed a lot, if you pour yourself out for somebody that's hopeless, it will help you. It will help you. It's like medication. It does something to our souls when we help people. And they're always going to be around. That's why Jesus looked at his disciples and said, the poor is always going to be among you. So many times Christ said to help the poor, help the poor. Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Deuteronomy 15, 11, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Proverbs 22, 9, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Give, and it will be given to you, Jesus said in Luke 6. Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured to you. So when the Bible talks about visit orphans and widows, those are the people that are forgotten, that are marginalized, that nobody cares about. Nobody's going to be like, hey, what do you think about this situation? They don't have a voice. No, nothing. And Jesus showed us in the Bible, in the New Testament, how to lift people up out of the ashes. So what are you doing? Now, there's amazing opportunities all around you. I just think of the stuff that we've seen in our life personally just from this verse. When we've wrestled with it at our last church and Rescue 100 came out of this verse. And next thing you know, there's thousands of kids all in our state and other parts of our country who have been adopted and fostered out of terrible situations because of this verse. It was this verse. Because I remember very first conversations had in an office with one person, and I'm talking to him, like, we got to do something. If nobody else does anything, I'm going to do anything, do something about it. we got to do something. Next thing you know, there's orphans that have been visited. It's amazing. But you got to do something. Question number six. Do you consistently favor the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God? Do you consistently favor the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of God? So when James says the last part of verse 27, oh yeah, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So we're supposed to keep ourselves unstained from the world. So when's the last time you told yourself, I need to seek the wisdom from God's word? I need to, like, here's one of the things that I use all the time in my life is the Google machine. Like, I feel like I get all my answers in my life from the Google machine. Sometimes I feel like I do. Everything that comes my way, all I got to do is ask the Google machine, right? Pull it up. How old is Jimmy Buffett? Man, I know right away how old Jimmy Buffett is. I got a question in my life. What does it take to be a good dad? What does a good dad do? 14 things makes a good dad. Thank you, Google machine. Everything you want to ask, you can ask your phone. Siri, you don't even have to type it in. Siri, hey, what's the best way to cook a brisket? This past uh, other day, I didn't do a very good job. You have 14 solutions to cooking a brisket. You can ask the Google machine everything. When's the last time you said, you know what? I'm going to seek the wisdom of God instead of the wisdom of the world. And I'm not saying it's a terrible thing to ask the Google machine stuff. But I'm saying if, if the, the wisdom of God is something that's to the side and we're like, I'm really going to seek God in this. That's what it means to keep oneself unstained from the world. The sinful pattern, the sinful way of wisdom that this world has to offer, we're like, no, nah, that's not really me. I'm going to really seek God in my life. I'm going to wait on him. I'm going to lean on him. I'm going to press into him. So how'd you do? There were six questions. Did you pass or fail? There were six questions. 
Take your test. Give it to your neighbor. We're going to check it. Just kidding. I mean, let's be honest. I failed. <laughs> I mean, I look at these questions. I'm like, come on. But then I have to remind myself. Praise God. God does not pass out F's. He doesn't do that. Why? Because he put the biggest F on Jesus. He says, you will be sin. You will become sin. So God can look at me and says, well done. You get an A. Based on what Jesus did. Why? You don't even have the ability in yourself to pass. You don't have what it takes. So when you go to a real classroom and you sit before a class and it's astrophysics and it's your first day to come to class and the professor's like, all right, class, you know what time it is. It's time for the test. I'm going to sit there and be like, I don't have what it takes. I can't pass this. And I'm going to be probably pretty comfortable with it. Because there's no way that I can get anything right on an astrophysics test. I just, I'm going to be like, ah, well, <laughs> I can't pass this test. And then there's this really smart kid sitting next to me. He says, dude, I wrote the book. You need your test. I'll pay you for it. So here we are. When James gives us these bullet points of this is question one, question two, question three, and you're burying yourself in this test. And Jesus whispers in her ear, hey, listen, I wrote your book. I'll take your test for you. So what am I going to do if this is my test and somebody who wrote the book is going to take it for me? The, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be like, well, all right, somebody else is taking my test for me. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. That there's this mountain this humongous mountain pressed upon you that you can't handle. And God says, well, you've got to handle it. I know you can't handle it, though. So I'm going to let somebody else handle it for you. And then Jesus says, I'm going to take that mountain. I'll take it upon myself. Y'all, this is good. So we have this unrelenting quest in our lives to measure up to how good we're supposed to be to pass all the tests and make sure the exam gets, gets, we get credit for this. And God's like, just, just calm down, calm down. Look, I know you don't have what it takes to pass the test. I, that's part of it. That's why Jesus, my son, steps in. He takes the test for you and he aces it. So when you look back at this test, all these questions we ask. I could sense a little bit of pressure on you a little bit. Ooh, didn't do good on that one. Ooh, that purity one got me. Ooh, the words one. Ooh, that got me. You, I could feel the weight. Now, so many times in a lot of our culture, there, there are churches that just make sure they load people up with all that weight. Hey, you better do what you're supposed to do. You better do it right, little mister. God's going to make something bad happen to you if you don't get it all right. And we got a lot of people teaching people that, hey, you got to do everything right all the time or something bad's going to happen to you. you got to walk that straight line, and if you mess up a little bit, you're going to get hurt. And if you get hurt because you mess up a little bit, it's your fault. You didn't measure up. You didn't do everything right like you were supposed to. And there's something in our soul that screams at that, and it says at the top of its lungs, it says, I don't have the ability to take this test. I don't have the ability. Please help me. I'm drowning. This test is giving me so much anxiety. I am sweating here as I'm coming into the class. Like I pause before I walk into the classroom. <sighs> take a deep breath and I walk in and I just melt because I can't do this. And God's like, why are y'all worked up? Look, I'll take care of it. Jesus took the test that you failed in the garden in Genesis 3. Jesus took the test in the garden. He passed. He died on the cross. He paid your penalty. Therefore, you're free to go. A plus, out the door. Now, does that mean because I've aced this test already in the sight of God, does that mean that I get to go just casually just 
seeking after and chasing the wisdom of this world and just running around with impure thoughts and just doing whatever I want to? No. Why? Because the weight of my exam was on him. Therefore, what I should do is be like, well, now you've accomplished everything I'm supposed to in God's word, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, wherever you go, whatever you say, man, I'm going to do whatever I can to love you and obey your commandments. Not to, to win some kind of favor from you, but because you've already done everything that gives me favor. So have the weight off me to accomplish everything that God wants for me to accomplish in his word. I got the weight off of me. I got the star sticker, A+. Plus, and now I'm just like, well, now I'm, I'm with him now. I'm going to go wherever he goes. So I'm going to stay close to him. He finished the test for me. Whatever, I'm going I'm to go, hey, can you help me out with this? I got, an, I got something else coming away. What do I do here? Like you got to be close enough to the master test taker so whenever something comes your way, he just reaches across. I, I got that too. I got that too. Something else is going to come your way. Something's going to nail you this week. Give it to Jesus. He's got that too. Don't let Satan trick you to think that you, you're not measuring up in God's eyes because you're failing at something in the law. That's why Jesus died. You don't have to re-crucify him because you feel bad every time you can't measure up. Chalk it up to grace. A plus, walk out the door in freedom. Paul wrote entire books based on freedom of the gospel. And we forget it every time, all the time. So, beloved, friends, family, I love you. I'm telling you this because you keep forgetting you already got an A. You keep forgetting. I keep forgetting. A plus, you passed. When God looks at you right now, does he, does he look at you like, ooh. Does he look at you like he's unpleased with your performance? Right now? If you, if you paint God in that light, if you say, well, right now God looks at me and he's very unpleased with my performance. You're missing the point of the gospel. And Jesus is whispering in your heart. He's saying, why did I die then? If I took everything, all the requirements of the law upon me, I lived the perfect life that you couldn't live, and then I died the criminal's death that you deserved, then what are we talking about here? But we have to continually remind our hearts of the gospel. We need to submit ourselves in every way to the master test taker. Because he's good. Praise God. Jesus, a success. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, that you look at my sinful, weary heart. And through your work on the cross, Jesus, you can, God, you can look at me as if I passed. It's hard for me even today, to remind myself of that. Because so many times I feel like I want to chase down approval and remind myself that, no, 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 there's still a lot more that i got to do to make sure God stays happy with me. God, that's not, that's not the gospel. Thank you for that. Remind our hearts of that. God, the, for the believer in here, the Christian in here, God, remind their hearts, their weary hearts, God, remind them that Jesus aced the test. Thank you. God, for the person that is not a believer, maybe they have not stepped fully into the grace of God. Lord, they, in their strength, in their own works and merit, they have to measure up to the weight of your test of the law. And they will fail. So, God, give us all the courage to throw that test on Jesus and say, whatever he did, that's enough. So God, for the unbeliever, the person that doesn't know you as their friend, their God, their Savior, Lord, I pray that you would awaken their heart to the truth of what you did in their life, God, and they would have the courage and the boldness to respond in faith and follow you every single day of their life. Thank you. We pray this for your good name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing another song. If there's anything you'd like for me to pray with you about, I'll be standing in the back, but let's worship.